mean, I can see you all because I had laser surgery yesterday as an outpatient. Um, and I was so stunned as I told the people at the gas station this morning. I mean, the man just put this machine up and went click, 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 click. And when they got through, I could see better. And I thought I could speak Russian too. So I don't know what happened there, but uh, <laughs> that's my only fun fact for the day. Now, the other part of it is, and somebody will ask this question, I'm sure. So I'm going to answer it now and just mess you up. I started writing poetry when I was 12. So that means that for the last 64 years, I have been writing and publishing. Wow. And I'm going to get good at it one of these days. <laughs> Thank you, Father Brown. Um, so I want to I want to pass the mic to you, Luthan Osman. Um, I was doing a little research on your website, and I, I noticed besides being an amazing essayist and poet, you're also a photographer and a filmmaker. So um, impressive. Um, just wanted to offer you the chance to introduce yourself, um, and yeah, just maybe tell us where you're calling from today. Um, I'm here in Brooklyn in Crown Heights where I've lived for a few years, but I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, so I'm really familiar with the Midwest. Um, visited Minneapolis and surrounding areas several times for work and just to see friends and things like that and have worked in with a couple of schools actually. Um, I'm so bad at introductions. Uh, always knew that I wanted to write. Um, that's what I went to school for. That's what, you know, I just persisted in doing. It's the main way that I know how to communicate with people. Um, and, you know, photography and film has been a little bit more loose. I uh, just needed that kind of expression as well. And so it was a lot of like trial and error and Googling and uh, <laughs> just uh, making an effort to try and, um, communicate with a series of compositions instead of one or, you know, taking a moment with a lyric. And so uh, maybe I'll be better at like answering questions, but anyway, that's no, hi that everyone. Is... I'm very glad to see your faces. Thank you, Luthan. Really appreciate that. And yeah, I, I'm very awkward at introductions. <laughs> I'm sure my questions are awkward too. Um, so our, our next uh, guest, Aisha Kamara, who I had the privilege of teaching, I was saying seven years ago, is now graduating from UW-Madison this year. Um, Aisha, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, hi everyone. Um, I was a former Crystal Ray student, so this is like jarring. I see my like principal, president, and like my science teacher. So I'm like trying, yes, okay, this is fun, this is fun. It's like a big reunion. Um, yes, yeah, so I am a current fourth year at UW-Madison. My major is human development and family studies. Um, I will be going to grad school to major in an MFA in creative writing um, at Randolph College, so that's exciting. And um, yeah, I've been writing also since I was 12 years old, but not as long as Mr. Brown. Um, for now, this is going to be like a 10 year anniversary. Oh, my God. So many like anniversaries and things like that. Um, and I worked with Sure It Speaks, which is a nonprofit organization in Minneapolis. And uh, I do visual art, like Lovin said. Ah, um, yes. And that I would say I would say I'm trying to be more firm in those things and stuff like that, like doing commissions. Um, and as you could see, I'm a makeup artist and I make content of like how to like teach people how to do their makeup and makeup expression. Um, and that also being a form of communication for me. Um, I'm in Aries, that's a big deal to me. Um, my birthday is on Sunday. And so I'm kind of geeked about that. And yes, so I'm super excited to be here and I'm super excited to see all your faces. So, and share a bunch of poems. Thank you, Aisha. Yeah, your energy is infectious. It's beautiful. All right, um, and I will just, I'll give you just a little prep that, um, yes, I, and I love that people are linking the sites. Thank you, love, and that's beautiful. Um, I'll also give you just a little, a little heads up. There will be one other poet visitor who's gonna be joining us, Michael Kleber Diggs. He's got a reading uh, till 7.30, so he may be coming a little later, but he's gonna be a guest and we'll be talking with some of our students as well. Um, but I think we're ready. I think we're ready to dive on in. Um, so that means that I get to introduce one of our student poets. 
So I just want to say it is my pleasure to introduce Zyra. Um, Zyra has been one of my junior students this year. She is such a fantastic writer um, in all genres. Um, she loves reading, of course, too, but started out the year just, just creating all these wonderful stories, both fiction and nonfiction. And I convinced her to join the Poetry Club, and we are so glad that you're a part of it, Zyra. Um, Zyra, why don't you take the floor? You got this. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so let me let me find my poem real quick because I do not memorize them. But um, yeah, so I am going to present with Father Brown and um, I was reading through his poems while I, um, I stumbled upon his poem called um, At the Edge. And I really felt inspired to you know, write my own kind of rendition or conversational poem or response to his. And um, yeah, I came up with a poem that's called A Woman Who's Had to Endure. And yeah, um, if Father Brown would want to read his poem first. Okay, then. I will do that, yes. And as background, uh, while this is a poem, my mother nursed my father for 12 years through cancer and my sister, my older sister, for about eight years through a variety of illnesses. But this was one that I was just thinking of and that's how I do them. At the edge, my mother loses breath and nerve as she watches my father resist all aid and ease for death. His life is devoured in larger doses daily without the rescue of imagination. He is letting go of sound and wit and serenity. Believing it to be a game of interference, he will not narcotize his pain and it spills onto us all. Restless, angry, impotent and vain to dream what will never be. He pushes us to dwell at the edge of a dwindling fire, a draining river and stare. Her bewildered hands scream out and grab her children. She would marry him and bear his sons. She will grieve when he is gone, but she cannot rest. Hearing him now unable to replace pain with peace. And she does not know how to scold him to go to sleep for fear that he would at last obey. Uh, yeah, so, you know, when I read that, I was just, you know, blown away because I mean I love the the spacing because I feel like you know as a reader I feel like spacing is really important in how you actually end up reading and saying a poem out loud and I think that one of the most important things I took from this poem was the way that I read it and the way that the spacing you know makes the poem even more powerful. So yeah, I love the poem. And like I said, it made me think of um, an experience that I saw in my family. And yeah, I made a poem that's called A Woman Who's Had to Endure. So I will read it now. Embroiled in heat with bubbling oil, shielding sound from breaking through the surface. I think about burning down this house, this man, 
this food. The extensions of your soul, a wife beaded tank and chain of gold, always worn down, but still protecting and guarding the vile aroma of your perpetual truth. A machista who has a wife that can't cook well enough or love well enough for the ringing in my ears never stopped repeating the thing you said to me last night. I never should have married you. I woke up to your dead body next to mine and looked at you for three long minutes. Without having a look of disgust reciprocated, I left, broke the news to our boys and wept for hours because you never said sorry, only through small kisses when you were drunk and a dependence that grew with your fragility did I feel loved. Despite having a husband who could not love, I still managed to hold on to your drawing breaths and gawking moments when you stared at nothing, then looked back at me and smiled. Your unavoidable truth could never break our love down. And it gave me mine, the woman who had to endure the mishaps of the world. If I could be a spark for a poem like that, I am forever grateful. Because I know what that feels like to read something and go, oh, wait, wait. As Zach knows so well, last spring, a young man who graduated from the University of Wisconsin Madison's hip hop studies program and is now in the graduate program at in creative writing at NYU, he sent me a poem about a man who was murdered by the police. And I read it and said, I have to do something. And I wrote a poem, The Lament. Ahmad Arbery, which Zach has published in Poetry Lockdown, America Magazine has published it, I put it on my blog. But the call and response of inspiration. Um, Zyra, your poem is as old as any poem could be. The, the feeling of the, you said it, the lines, the spaces, the breaking, the rhythm, that's modern poetry. And I love the way you started off with a very long line and then one word, two words, one word, two words. I could feel that pulse of the body. And <laughs> just nobody in the world will ever do anything better that I woke up to your dead body next to mine and looked at you for three long minutes without having a look of disgust reciprocated. Own that one. You gave it to the world and I am so, I was just so touched when I read this. Last story I'm gonna tell and then you can jump in and do whatever you want to. My father's mother, the father who is kind of the subject of this poem's meditation. She and my grandfather were married for 63 years. When we went into a financial tailspin, the family had to move to the projects in East St. Louis. They lived in one building, my grandparents, and we, the family, lived in another one. And my grandfather was blind because he had untreated diabetes. So inequities in healthcare are nothing new. Back in the 1930s and 40s, he went blind because of untreated diabetes. And my grandmother took care of him. 
Well, he came down with awful cancer. And my cousin Catherine went to visit them one day. And my grandmother said to her, Catherine, you hear that man in there groaning with so much pain? That's God punishing him for what he did to his family. But I'm going to take care of him until he dies. I found out from my cousin Catherine that my grandfather used to bring his girlfriends home and have my grandmother cook for both of them. Yes, yes. Not really, Pearl of Flores. I, yes, you, 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 you're, you're doing it right for me. 63 years, she nursed him. And I lived him by another 20. She was 104 when she died. Uh, you muted. You're muted, Father Brown. I'm sorry. Art is always true, even if it is not historically factual. And the truth you put in this poem is worth this entire evening. So thank you. Thank you, Father Brown. Thank you, Zaire, for kicking this off so strong. Um, I just saw. I thought I saw Precious join the call. She was going. She was going to read a poem. And now I'm not seeing her. So <laughs> we, we will go back to Precious and, and her poem. She's written a really powerful poem. I, I, I want us to hear it. Um, but I also, just in the interest of time, want to make sure we get a chance to hear, right. um, hear from other poets. So I think what I'll do right now is, um, let's see here, Janelle, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you because I know you have, have been uh, reading a good deal of, of Luthan Osman's work. So you can talk about uh, the poem that you'd love to hear. Um, and then you can have uh, start off a little conversation with Luthan. You wanna take the floor, Janelle? Yeah, um, well, hi. I want to say that I've read a few of her poems and my favorite one was The Keep. Um, Could I just take a minute? For sure. Did, did you want Luthan to read the poem first? Um, okay, I'm sorry. But I was saying that um, that I was reading the key and I really, really liked it. There was a part that I really liked and I can't find it right now, but um, it was kind of like a metaphor where it said like, um, I'm gonna look for the key or I can't, fi I can't find it um, and that I'm gonna look for it because of like an, a metaphor between a door and a key. And um, something that I wanted to ask was that, um, what was kind of like the experience that inspired her to write this poem? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure if I should just jump into answering. Um... I, you know, I was thinking about a lot of different things, um, mainly how there are different things about childhood that are tough to let go of, even if you think that you've moved past it and that there are so many different kinds of ghosts and echoes. Um, and one of those that's really powerful is um, feeling like you're a stranger always, you know, <laughs> in the US or that's how I felt anyway, and also, that combined with different kinds of social and economic pressures and watching your parents struggle with that and suffer with that and being aware that adults can suffer and having to learn that too young. And so I was considering that and that's part of the poem, a uh, reason why the poem, um, so Zach has the, he has it on the Google Docs, but if the, I shared a screenshot of it just because the formatting was done in a different program. And so it looks very, 
boxed in because that's so often what that pressure and even the pressure that those memories create um, can feel like for me. And so those are some of the things that I was thinking about. Um, Would you like to read it? Sure. Uh, okay. Um, so the key. I was under the kitchen table guessing who was at the sink by how they used water when I heard my mother say to my father, what about this job, that one, those people, did they call? And my father said, everyone says no. I see all the doors, but none of them will open. My mother said, maybe we just haven't found the right key. I'll go look for it. They laughed for a long time. Their toes looked at each other. Maybe they forgot the bag of keys in the crooked mouth dresser. I lined up the keys on a windowsill, metal on metal on my fingers until they smelled like missing teeth. I looked at the best one, large cursive F, a scarlet ribbon tied to it. It had two teeth like my baby sister. I tried the little door behind the community center, then the big kid's door at my school, the shed of a house with a backyard so large the family could never see me. I got grass and sand and an ignorant pebble in my shoe. Dust climbed up my pants so I could spit spell my name on my leg when resting. I went back to our neighborhood. There was a black cloud over it while the nice neighborhood down the hill shone. A girl said our house was darkest and the first raindrops fell on it because we're all going to hell. When I told my father, he said it was isolated or separated storms. So it was true. We were set apart for a punishment. The next day, dozens of dead flying ants covered our patio. I took all the keys and tried all the doors in the abandoned mall, one unlocked. It was a room with white walls, floor, ceiling, white squares of wood flat or leaning in every corner. The door closed behind me and no key would work. Maybe the room would, maybe the room would swallow me and I'd get invisible if I didn't stop screaming, but then a surprised guy, white, wearing white, opened the door. I wanted to try one more time, but my keys disappeared and everyone said they were never real. Yeah. Well, snapping. Um, this, yeah, this is an incredible poem. Um, Janelle, did you want to say say more about the poem, or ask a question? Um, no, I was just gonna say that I really, really liked it, um, and that I don't think that I can maybe like identify with it, but it's still a poem where you can kind of visualize yourself in. And it's really beautiful. Thank you so much, Chanel. I'm looking forward to hearing your poem. I see another correspondent of yours left and on the call. Helen, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. So hi, hi. I'm Helen. <laughs> How are you? And I'm really good. I'm really excited to meet you. I read a lot of like Wikipedia stuff about you, but you know, Wikipedia is fake. So, but I do have a lot of questions for you. You you really do fascinate me as a person and yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know what to say now. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, should I ask you some questions or should I tell you um, my, fa my favorite poem that you wrote or? 
I think this is your time, you know, whatever you want to do and whatever you find useful. And, you know, this doesn't have to be the last time we communicate. We can do something through email. I can drop into a class if Zach's open to that. So it's whatever you want. Yeah. Well, I, I have one question, actually a lot, but um, yeah, okay. So the question I'm gonna ask you is, has your poetry um, ever brought you conflict in your community or not in your community? Uh, yeah, but you know, I think it's the kind of conflict that comes anyway that because people have ideas that certain people should just shut up, you know, that they shouldn't have anything to say. So I don't know, you know, I'm also just, I can be a very difficult person. Sorry, let me just link this. I'm not like, Zach's probably much better at this. I haven't had to teach much via Zoom. Um, uh, I mean, I think I can be a very difficult and very headstrong person. My parents would call me stone-headed. And then I think one thing that's a really interesting image and one that shows up in scripture is that, you know, even a stone can break and a stone, you know, can burst forth with water. And so that kind of how I think there's the conflict of like, you're talking about things that are personal or even if the poems are not about me, you're making a spectacle of yourself or it's shameful to talk about like desire or disappointment or failure. Um, you know, some of the things do correlate directly to things that have to do with my family. And there are a lot of things that don't have that much to do with like with my family or autobiography or anything, but people will assume that it does. And so sometimes there's, you know, of course, criticism and pushback, but you know, at the end of the day, I just have this one life and time is so precious. And so I have to be able to, to tell the truth and to not live my life in a way that is really contained, you know, because then that's a kind of violence that you can't get rid of, right? Like when you let that inside of yourself, like how do you then sleep? How do you look at yourself in the mirror? How, how are you at peace when you're taking a shower or sitting in the bath? And that to me is really unbearable. And so sometimes there's there's some conflict, but like I said, I can be a very difficult person. I'm pretty tall in real life. Like people don't actually, I mean, I'm very grateful for that, mashallah, but people don't actually confront me much in real life. And so that's good too. <laughs> Whoa, you you sound like you're writing. Like, like you sound so like po poetic and it's, oh, wow. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, the second question that I have is I was reading um, a writing that you wrote for the woman who love is a bird of passage. Mm -hmm. um, should I insert the poem in the chat or do you know that poem? Um, I think Zach might have it. And um yeah and i'll just read out of the book because that's less complicated for me uh so uh these poems that i'm reading are from my first book which is the kitchen dwellers testimony so i should just be clear about that and i think there's like a discount code if any of you are interested in buying it or if you want to buy it for your students and i can just dig around for that um so this is um for the woman whose love is a bird of passage I am so poor before you. A grackle whose colors are as good as a peacock's, sometimes better in the full face of sun. The love poem I meant to say is lost. Instead, I swear an oath. I curse like someone speaking in a foreign language. Instead of leave, I say scourge. The proper word, a chick's voice still in its egg, a beak in a small crack. Your blood is hot and flowing and the hinges of your heart's valves allow traffic in all your heart's rooms. Is that why the little kisses are not enough? In your sigh, there is the sound of water pouring into a hot, empty kettle. Let us have the same dream tonight, I say. 
and your smile is red glass in dim light. I dream my front tooth is a crumbling pillar and you are the entire city of sin in collapse. Instead of leave, you say raise. You are so poor before me. So let us paint the ocean instead. We dip the brushes in a canvas that takes them out of our hands. Now you are the grackle's tail calling for eyes from the side of the road and I am the best room in your heart. Thank you. That was amazing. That was amazing. And I really enjoyed uh, um, reading your work, so I'm super excited also to hear your poem. Oh, 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 sorry, I just get off topic sometimes. Um, <laughs> That's okay. I don't. Um, I I forgot that I was um, reading it, but um, I'll give it a shot. Um, uh, where is the dock again? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so this poem was inspired by Susan B. Anthony. I actually wrote it in eighth grade. And um, I wrote it because at that time, I didn't really feel like my my body was really valued as a woman. And mm -hmm. I feel like once we're young, we know what stereotypes are and we know how to live it out. And just reading a poem that I wrote when I was younger kind of shows like, like how I thought. I don't know if it was, I thought it was kind of interesting. But okay. <laughs> All right. Growing up, I was told, dress like this, act like that. Society trying to mold me into their experimental rat. My body does not define me, so society let my mind be. They say you fight like a girl. You fight like you've been facing oppression your whole life. You fight like you're sick and tired of a country where you are never valued for what's inside. So I ask myself, what is a woman? They say a woman can't be a, a leader, but yet she led the women's suffrage movement. But wait, why can't women be in power? They say they're weak, sassy, uneducated, bossy. Little do they know we are smart. I mean, powerful, smart, independent, assertive, and bold, just like her. Susan B. Anthony was fearless and convicted and tried to go against society's side. They say women can't have rights, but she gave us a right to have a future so bright. So who is she? She is Susan B. Anthony. The right of citizens of the United States to vote should not be denied by the count of sex. The law she fought to make called the 19th Amendment of the Constitution. Because of her, women are free. She gave us the key to grow into who we want to be, but the work is not over yet. Misrepresentation by the media, unequal pay, the shame and the blame they place on women is so what we have to face. Women everywhere, keep fighting, keep marching, keep moving. Susan B. Anthony won the battle, but yet we need to win the war. Yeah, but that's, that's my poem. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a, a poem. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I'm totally gonna brag about this. Um, be like, ah, my whole class and you got to listen to me read a poem. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, yeah. It's, it's my honor, like really. I'm super glad to be here and to be connected, so thank you. Yeah. Speaking of honors, this this is just 
uh, an English teacher's dream. <laughs> this is so fun. Um, you all are wonderful. Um, I also want to acknowledge we've got a new guest here, um, Michael Kleber Diggs. Am I saying your last name right? I actually didn't. Uh, is that is that right, Michael? That is right. You nailed it. Awesome. Um, Michael was also one of the uh, the poets who who was corresponding with uh, my students during this winter. Um, has a new book coming out this year. Um, won, a, won a major prize here in St. Paul. Um, terrific human being, uh, essayist, poet, extraordinaire, teacher. Um, Michael, we're, we're so glad to have you here. Yeah, it's it's my honor to be here. I'm so sorry I'm late. I I made a um, time zone error on my calendar. Uh, and so I didn't realize I had a conflict until uh, pretty late in the process. But thank you for uh, inviting me and for allowing me to come, uh, you know, to the party late. Oh, no worries. It is so good to have you. Um, and Michael, I will introduce a student to you in, in a few minutes, but I also, I wanted to acknowledge that we had um, an, another student who was going to read earlier with Father Brown, who joined later, Precious. Um, and Precious, if you wanted to read your poem, uh, we would love to hear it. I know Father Brown would love to hear it too. And I know you also were having maybe a question for Father Brown, so we can we can track to Father Brown and then uh, and then check in with you, Michael. How are you doing, Precious? Hi, I'm good. Can you guys see me? I don't know if I can. I'm having technical errors with my phone, so sorry if you guys can't hear me or see. We hear we hear you, Precious, loud and clear. Okay, I'm gonna read my phone. Am I supposed to share it on the screen? Because I'm not on my computer. Okay. Um. So the poem I wrote was um. Was about Trayvon Martin, and basically, um, thinking about that situation, I just reflected on it, and I was just like writing my thoughts about how I felt about the situation and situations similar similar to it. And the poem I wrote is called Protect and Serve. One shot, boom. I see my unopened pack of Skittles leave my hand. I slump, in, I slump in your arms. The dark gray of my hoodie turning into a dark red. I can feel the bullet as it tears through my rich skin, piercing my lungs. You are the last person I see before I leave this world. I want to ask you so many questions. Why does the darkness of my skin frighten you so? Why was I a threat to you? Why did your paranoia overwrite my my own defenses? Forget the standard goal, the standard ground law that emboldened you to take power. What about the law to save my life? Your bullet has made me another statistic, but I'm not a statistic. I am a person. I have a name. Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Michael Brown, Botham Dean. Future gone too soon. I have a family. They will never see me again. I had a future I never got to live, but my legacy is stronger than your bullets. My memory, my memory will still be around. When future generations hear my name, it will move them to act for justice. Your name will be spent like the bullet that you thought brought you so much power. What type of world do we live in? Someone's life can be taken away because of someone else's fear. Fear? Was it fear or prejudice? It still ceases to amaze me how we are teaching kids how to deal with the police instead of teaching them their ABCs. One, two, three. Eric Gardner could not breathe, but yes, society has clipped our wings, but still we soar. Your bullets have shot down our existence. Still our voices shout. We will not back down. My answer is yes. <laughs> Your involvement by making yourself open and becoming Trayvon is exactly what we're supposed to do in poems so often. Give voice to the voiceless, go inside the mind and tell the world what will be forever hidden. 
And I was very proud to read your poem because your generation has got to speak for each other. Uh, so I really do appreciate that. And before you were able to get on here, we were talking about the one poem that Zach uh, did a great job publicizing from, from the one that I wrote last year for Ahmad Arbery. But I have been writing poems like that, The Children of Atlanta, the young boy whose body was found in a deserted building in St. Louis. Uh, right before Christmas, those, we have got to speak. It's always about say their names and they'll never be forgotten. But if we go deep enough with our imaginations, we can speak their names as if it is in their own voice. So I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback as well. Um, my question I have for you was, um, what has been the most inspirational moment in your life? And what was your push start to start writing poetry? <laughs> um, I, I can't give you an answer to the most inspirational moment in my life, but I will say this. Now I just got through saying that, so now I'm gonna say it. When I realized that my grandfather was teaching me how to read even though he was blind, I can never, ever, ever, ever not understand that that was one of the most important insights in my life. He taught me how to read, even though he was blind. He made me read to him every day when I came home from school in the second grade. I cannot imagine what he had to endure. But he wanted me to learn. What made me start writing? I was a reader. I think reading helped me deal with the fact that I had been severely abused as a child. And reading was the greatest escape I could have because I could go places and didn't have to talk. So I read my sister, she's 10 years, she was 10 years older than me and I read her literature books and I read my father's literature books from when he was in grade school back in before the, right around the turn of the century, ninth, the 20th century. And um, I used to like to hear the music of poetry. So one day when I was 12 years old, I decided I'd see if I could imitate some of these things I like to read. So I just lay down on the floor one night, October, that evening, and I wrote something to imitate something I read in the magazine and I showed it to my father. He said, that's good, son, you ought to keep doing it. And all through my life, when it's ever been so bad that I can't really tell somebody what I'm really feeling, I can tell myself in somebody else's voice. So the conversation goes on forever. And I appreciate your asking me that question because I don't think I ever would have answered it otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Precious, and thank you, Father Brown. Um, and I didn't get a chance to brag on you, Precious. I am, I am so grateful I got to teach you two years in a row. Uh, you are amazing. And you, you just inspire me by how real you are, Precious. Like, I've always appreciated when you write, you write from what you see and from your heart uh, and from your guts. And it's, it's impressive. So I give you one of these big, nerdy Mr. Zaya Air Vibes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that Thank with you. us. You're amazing. Um, I believe, I thought I saw, a, I mentioned earlier, one of my students, uh, Khadijah, who's gonna be talking to you, Aisha. I thought I saw her on the call and then I saw her drop off for a second. The reason I mentioned that is because originally we had thought she was gonna go in the eight to 8.30 time slot, Aisha, because she's at work and she said she had the slot. So I'm gonna keep an eye out for her if you see her come back on. But um, We'll, we'll, we'll roll into, uh, into you, Michael, if that's okay. Um, so let me, and if, and if we see Khadija come on, let's, we'll all kind of holler at her. Um, okay, and I'll, and we, can, we can pause for sure. Okay. Um, but let me introduce to you, Michael, uh, the first student who, who's gonna interact with you, Jacqueline. Um, it has been my pleasure uh, to teach you uh, this year, Jacqueline. Jacqueline has been writing up a storm all year long in my English classes and recently joined Poetry Club. We're so psyched to have her. 
Um, Jacqueline's been diving into your blog and your poetry. <laughs> so um, Jacqueline, I'll, I'll let you take the floor. You can introduce yourself to Michael. Hello, Michael. Hello. <laughs> My name is Jacqueline. Um, yeah. Okay, I don't know how to start this, but um, I ran across, well, initially I ran across your poem, America's Loving Me to Death which I really loved because it was just so amazing, especially how when you started it with the title, like each sentence start, like each the sentence, like the word letters started with the title, but then the ending had like the Pledge of Allegiance and it was just a great juxtaposition. I, it was amazing, hands down, it was so good. And I would, <laughs> and I was reading your other, um, writings uh, like how you uh, you wrote one where it was like I think it was called I really don't care do you it was like a modern American constructionism um, in Todd Phillips there was I read like how a good per how a good person responds to the border crisis and how and here comes the new Joe same as the old Joe and it was all amazing writing I think something about your writing is that it's just really I don't know how to explain it but it, so, it sounds so grounded it's so powerful it's so real and I really love that about your writing and one that stuck out to me that I would like you to read um is how a good person responds to the uh to the <laughs> to the uh how a good person responds to the border crisis if you don't mind sharing this to everyone okay um uh, give me a moment to find that one. It, but thank you so much um, for all those kind thoughts. I really appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> um, so this is I, I pulled it uh, up the uh, I pulled it up the blog, Michael. I think this is the right text, right? Are you seeing this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, let me talk about my blog for a second. I. I have a blog, which is not a very 21, 21 thing to do, but, uh, and I haven't, I haven't posted to it in a while, um, but from time to time, I want to just write about what I'm thinking at the time. And I wanna post it without being too precious about it and, and emphasize the idea and not the, the person behind it. So um, I, I am frequently making some kind of argument and, thinking about things rhetorically. So how a good person responds to the border crisis. I am a good person. I am not a bad person. Because I am a good person, I could not support a bad person. Also, I could not support a person who would do bad things. If you see it differently, you have to be wrong. Because I'm not a bad person, I'm a good person. You say the president is holding these kids at the border away from their parents without things kids need. You talk about children at the border being held in very cold, crowded pens, no beds or cots, lights on 24 hours a day, sleeping on concrete, choosing between using their one blanket for padding or warmth, not enough space, no soap or toothpaste, no toothbrushes or blankets, very few diapers, kids watching kids, little to no adult supervision, wearing the same clothes they arrived in weeks ago, hungry, inadequate nutrition, eating the same food every meal, every day, little or no time outside, flu becoming a concern, lice becoming a concern, inadequate medical care, dying. You say seven children have died. Well, I support the president. Because I am a good person, I would not support a bad person. Therefore, the president is not a bad person. Because I am a good person, I would not support bad things. In fact, we're protecting our border, which is a good thing. Without borders, we don't even have a country. And even if those things are bad, none of it is my fault. It's the fault of the parents who brought their children here illegally. You say they didn't do anything illegal. They were seeking asylum. I say they came in at the wrong point of entry, which is against the law. You say that's a misdemeanor. I say they're still committing a crime. You say a very small crime, which does not justify taking there. I say it's still a crime. You say not all of them have committed a crime. I say most of them have. You disagree and start talking about the news. 
but I know the news is fake because the news implies I'm a bad person for liking the president and wanting a stronger border, but I'm not a bad person. So the news has to be a lie. I'm a good person who supports the president and borders. So this can't be my fault and it can't be the president's fault. You can't blame border agents either. They are good people doing their jobs. You can't blame conservatives generally. I'm conservative or America. America is exceptional. Blame the children's parents. Their actions are wrong. They broke the law. We're just enforcing the law. And like all good people, I support the law. What are we without our laws? You will say, but we should, but should we shouldn't punish the child the sin for the sins of the parent. I say lots of parents, people have bad parents. I can't save them all. Besides, parents bring their kids on purpose for sympathy. They're using the kids. You say, we're actively making things worse. You say, we're using the kids too. I say, you have to be cruel to be kind. We need a way to deter people from making the dangerous journey here. You say, the deterrent isn't working. Border crossings are up. Well, it will work eventually. I trust the president. He's a master strategist. That's one reason I voted for him. And he's a great president too, because if he wasn't, then that would mean I don't know a great president when I see one. Finally, you say, but what about the children? To that, I say I am a good person and good people do not turn their back on suffering children. Therefore, the children are not suffering. You say something about beliefs and facts and I say, I am not a bad person. And it's wrong of you to suggest I am a bad person. You do the same thing with my views on climate change and evolution, my religious freedom, my gun rights, my desire to keep my job from going overseas, my desire to go back to the good old days in America. You make me feel guilty. It's wrong of you to make me feel guilty. Only a bad person would do that. You are a bad person. I am not a bad person. I am a good person. And, and thanks, Jacqueline. <laughs> I have not read that in a super long time. Like, um, you know, I just wanted to play with syllogisms and how logic, you know, if A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then A has to be greater than C or how it can lead us to conclusions or in fact, how our desire for outcomes can promote um, all the reasoning along the way or, or corrupt it, probably better to say. It, what struck me from that whole story, that dialogue was like, just, it's so, it's like, it's so real. Like, I feel like I've had a conversation with someone like this. I feel like I've seen videos of these kind of people. That's why it struck me. Um, I think another reason why is because I kind of find it personal, not because I know I have a friend whose parents are immigrants, but because a couple of years ago, my parents were immigrants. And you would not believe the fear that I had when, when me and my siblings had when two policemen came knocking on our door. I think that's what people, that's what children of immigrants fear the most is that you don't know when it'll be the last time you'll see your parents. And I have a younger brother who's six now, but he was like four or I don't even know. And just seeing him in those kind of position was is like heartbreaking for me. It's like yeah, I could yeah. not. <laughs> and so I find that really personal. It's like it's so good. Yeah. And Jacqueline, I mean, that's real trauma. Uh, we think of of home and what we desire of home as sanctuary, a place where we feel safe. Um when you speak of your experience as, as a recent immigrant, that specific experience is not familiar to me. Uh, my ancestors have been on American land for seven generations and maybe further back than that because the counting gets a little funny um, as you go back kind of far, but um, your experience of the feelings that you're having when the police knock on your door the concern that you have for your family and your loved ones, I can connect to that. I can connect to that. 
Um, and that's the way that the conversations that we have help us build community, help us build understanding and help us feel less alone. So thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm so sorry uh, that that came to your house. Very sorry. Thank you, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Turned out it was just for a license plate that it was my oldest sister. <laughs> right. Totally big mistake. We all. We didn't say anything to her, but and it was yet, when we were, and my yet. siblings were glaring at her back when she would yeah. come over, but yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think it's my turn to read my- Please. Um, so yeah, we, uh, for class, we did a personal essay, political essay and I'm a pretty silly person, so I thought I thought I would make something more of like lighthearted, which I thought beauty. And I thought about the recent most recent experience I had, and I was looking at a filter on Snapchat, and I was like, "Hey, I don't really like how this looks." And so I made this essay. <laughs> I called it "Beauty and Folly." Um, I frowned at my phone. I mean, I knew it was ugly, but I trailed off. I looked down at the phone in my hand the camera adorning a filter on me. It looked unusual, but I could not place my finger on it. It was, it was an itch I couldn't reach, never close, but never fought. It wasn't until I sat alongside my pale and slender sister for a photo together when it hit me, like a six-wheeler trailer. All, my, uh, all these filters lightened my skin. More and more filters lightened my skin. It never stopped. It bothered me so much. It was like voluntarily reaching down the kitchen drain, barehanded to touch the gunk of dinner's leftovers. Rounding down my face and eyes looked so silly. Why was this trend everywhere on social media? These small, subtle differences influence a person. It warps your perspective in a way. That doesn't look like you. Well, yeah, of course. It's like a drawing people, you know? I grinned goofily. It's just that you made yourself look prettier. The grin stretched across my face, was wiped off, and embarrassment flared up across my face like wildfire. I felt the boring stale stares my table mates began giving me, swiveling in their seats to get a good look at me. I looked down at the thin, tall doodle that was supposed to be me. Prettier, I asked. He blanched. I didn't mean it like that. I was just saying. I held up my hand, smiling. No, no, it's okay, I understand. This incident was like a wallop to the face. My face was searing hot. I could cook an egg if I were to break it on my face. My tongue felt swollen, but it wasn't because I was basically told I was unattractive. I was basically, it was because I unconsciously agreed with him. I had tweaked myself in my drawing to look pleasing to the eye. And I was caught in the act, like a deer caught in headlights. And I felt awful, awful about it. But foolishly, the only thought that echoed in my mind as the long stares burned my face was, can they tell too? That was the last time I drew myself back in middle school. Our surroundings influence a person's expectations, be it popular artists and celebrities, actual art, novels, and video game. It's in your face. I long for when I can look at the mainstream media and think, that's pretty accurate. Smile and carry on my day because it's normal. I do think in recent years, we're heading the right direction. Whoa, who's that? Who, her? Oh, she's gonna be the new Disney princess Moana. Moana, she looks really cool. Yeah, she looks kind of like you. I pointed at myself, me? I've never been compared to a Disney princess, especially one with a thick waist, a, bulb a bulbous nose, round face, and proportions that seem more plausible for a human. And credulously, I asked myself, is this even possible? Thanks. You draw yourself more attractive. That's not how you look. All artists have heard it before. It may be so, but everyone conforms to this as well. Humans crave symmetry and want to look like what the world wants. We try to put perfection where it does not exist. And beauty in, uninterested me until I ran across a Korean group, Mamamoo. People who talk too much always die first, so raise yourself up. It was a simple but powerful lyric. 
different body shapes and like the Korean beauty standards dance gleefully and fervently across the stage, I was at awe. In this bubble of catchy tunes and powerful females, I saw beauty bloom before my eyes in any shape, way, or form. I saw it in everyone, including myself. Mm. And yeah, that was all. Let's hear it for self-love also. That's critical. Thank you for that, Jacqueline. I love the path that it traveled. And that was no way silly. No. No, don't ever say that about yourself. That was incredible. <clears throat> Thank and you. I, I also <laughs> agree you. with the comments in the chat. You read beautifully. Thank you. I yeah. always get so nervous, but I was trying to be more expressive. This is this is beautiful and moving. Um, oh, so was someone speaking? I'm sorry. Did I interrupt someone? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, just because I know Khadija, you have limited time because you're at work. Um, uh, yeah, you're. I, I will get to you and Michael, um, but I want to make sure Khadija, you get a chance to to interact with Aisha, who is here on the call. Um, Khadija, are are, are you? Uh, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Um, to folks who don't know, I had I've had the privilege of teaching Khadija the last two years uh, in my English classes. She's an incredible writer, an incredible poet, an incredible person. Um, Khadija, you are really interested in talking with Aisha about some of her poetry. Do you want to you want to take the floor, take the mic? Yes, definitely. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, hi, Aisha. Hi. What's up, girl? Um, What's up, <laughs> okay. Um, so, like, I was reading your poems, and I was trying to, like, decide which one I would, you know, have to talk to you about. And honestly, we write so differently. So, like, it, it makes sense why I couldn't find, put pin my hand on one poem. But this poem that we both really relate to is about religion, and we're both Muslim. And I just wanted to um, talk to you a little bit about that. But first, I have a few questions that I wrote down, and here is one of them. Um, I would love for you to like speak on the stereotypes of Muslim people being um, compared to ISIS. Mm, yeah, I think it's like a, like, okay, this might sound like kind of grim, but like out of all of like the mean things I've heard in my life, I feel like that's like one of the weaker ones. It's, it's a very like easy and like quick jab to say to people. Um, and it lacks like a wittiness that I think like people would assume that they have when they say those kind of things um, versus like, what is something that's quick and easy um, for somebody to grab to, to say to me, um, you know, and it's always, it's always an afterthought too, because I don't necessarily um, present as somebody who's Muslim, like what we traditionally like understand as like um, people who dress or sound Muslim, whatever, like the media has like presented that too. So it's always, it's always this like, oh, you know, I thought, I thought you were black. I didn't know you were Muslim and like that kind of like conversation. So then it's like, um, this way that somebody says it to like protect themselves. Um, again, like, I think it's a very silly thing, but it's definitely something that I had to like grow out of, right? Um, I went to Crystal Ray, so I was like one of the only Muslim girls in my class. So a lot of the work that I had to do was less so about um, asking, like to interrogate somebody of like, what do you mean when you say that? But more so people literally not understanding that there's so many more similarities through monotheistic religions than there are differences, right? And this quite literally lack of learning and education that people have around Islam. I grew up like going to black churches with my friends. So I knew, I already knew a lot about Christianity before I went to Christ Ray. And as y'all know, we have um, a religion course every year. So like, I never had that like uh, moment of ignorance that was necessarily harmful to somebody. I think my most ignorant like comment was that I thought Baptists were the only folks that get baptized because like very much in the name, like, you know, A plus B equals C. And like, and then somebody who told me like, okay, well, that's not, that's not how we do it. And I'm like, okay, word, right? So then 
also are you using your ignorance to be willfully hurtful to somebody is very different than using your ignorance to then gain access and knowledge to the people around you I think for me that's what like where my mind goes when I hear those comments like that that somebody is trying to use their ignorance to like harm me um versus like this being a middle ground where we can have this like intellectual conversation about x y and z that's amazing because i never actually thought about that like someone's ignorance could lead to you know breaking someone's um thoughts or whatever they feel about themselves you know like i've never thought about that so thanks for that perspective um another question that i have is what are your influences when it comes to writing poetry um i think um Okay, literally, okay, I'm kind of obsessed with Lovin. If anyone has noticed by my comments about hyping her up my every third thought, um, I really love Lovin. And I've just been very oh, grateful that I got to be you. in communication with her for so long. So that, okay, there's that. I'm gonna put that out of the way and then everything else. Um, I'm really intrigued with Jane Ball's, Baldwin's work. Like I, everything, but mostly like, mostly, his literal cadence and like how he talks and how like everything sounds so scripted but like you know he's saying this right off the top of his head it's absolutely stunning um Audrey Lord um I think it's called either sister sister or lost sister I think is the book is the excerpt that I'm referring to and then Missy Elliott is not a writer but Missy Elliott very much inspires like this right and like how and how much like how we think about like Afrofuturism and like I'm always trying to think about the possibilities. I'm a very optimistic person. So like I never like to tell myself that I can't do something or that something is off limits to me because nothing is off limits to me. That's just some other idea that somebody wanted me to believe but I don't believe them. Um, so Miss Elliott is often that like function that like pushes me to say like, oh, nothing is impossible. Um, my mom is uh, very much the reader of our family versus writing anything. Like my older brother writes short stories. My older sister Fatima is also a poet. Miriam likes writing poetry, but she feels like she's not good. I think she's great. Um, but my mom has always kind of felt like she's never been that great a writer, but my mom is such a good, good good um reader of like reading something and being able to be like this is what it is and so my mom always pushes me to like reread things to then learn more about them um she also because she hard-headed if I'm hard-headed that's where I got it from and so when I'm in conversations with her it's kind of like two stones clicking um but like that makes me practice like patience and stuff so those are like people that I think about like and who would inspire me like when I'm writing awesome so like when you're talking about James Baldwin's cadence to his writing would you say like that's where you got your grounded groundness of writing from I would say yes and because I was also reading before I was writing poetry I actually in like the seventh grade we had to do like a poetry unit and we were reading Robert Frost and I do not like Robert Frost I'm gonna just mm -mm. Mm -mm. and I remember we had to do an assignment to mimic his writing you know what is that poem two paths diverge and I choose the one less nah nah and so I told my professor I mean not my professor my teacher I was like I'm not doing that and he was like okay if you can write a better poem then I will cut this whole section the whole class doesn't have to do it I was writing my butt off I took spent the whole night trying to write like a better poem than that because I really didn't want to do that assignment and I was also at the time saying like here are better writers like my older sister was a better writer and she was like 15 um and I went to class and I performed it and like they were like oh it's so good da, da, da. I said I know I know and my sister wrote it and she was like okay yeah but you could do better and I was like all right you're a hater and that summer going into Crystal Ray actually like going into my freshman year I took a course at the Pillsbury house um in Minneapolis and I basically like every Tuesdays and Thursdays I like went and wrote with like other poets I wrote with my sister and my sister was a slam poet when we think a slam is basically the competitive aspect of writing poetry so for all the folks who shared if you basically put it on your feet and like went and performed that's like slam and that I think was the point where I was like oh this 
you know, people actually really do this. Like, you know, cause James, you know, the writers that I was reading, a lot of them had already passed away. Right. And like thinking about Maya Angelou, who was, who hadn't passed away at the time, but like was somebody that in a way felt unattainable, like my sister and like being in those community spaces, then like form my ideas around poetry. So I was definitely mimicking my sister. I was definitely mimicking, mimicking James Baldwin, uh, Toni Morrison, um, Gwendolyn Brooks were like woman icons that I was like, I want to sound like them when I go on stage for sure. That is amazing. I find myself always mimicking Maya Angelou and Sojourner Truth. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this one poem where I wrote in the words of Sojourner Truth and it was, it just came to me and I wrote it and it was, it just came out um, really great. So thank you for that. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and read my poem to you. And this poem, um, so a little backstory behind it is about body um, positivity. And I know you write a lot about po body positivity in a lot of political poems too. And this poem is basically about one day me walking to work and a guy stopping me on the way trying to ask him my number. And this is some older guy that, you know, I obviously do not want to interact with and it inspired this poem. So it's titled, When He Sees Me. When he sees me, I know where his mind wanders to. His soul claims his alter ego, bringing him to peace, bringing him to the confidence he finds in himself at last. You're so beautiful. Is it okay for me to talk to you? I should say no, but I don't want to be rude, so I guess I have time today. He goes on and on about how pretty I am. He doesn't care about my age at this time, so I mentioned I'm 17. I lied that I'll be 18 in November. Really, it's in May. He says, I can wait for you. For who? I don't believe his charming voice brings me this much comfort. I don't believe his immediate kindness to care about how I'm doing or where I'm going. Instead, I relive the days as a middle schooler, walking down the dusty roads of my neighborhood and every corner meant clenching onto my backpack to hide my nerves. I believe this is when I, st I started learning to mask my emotions. I relive those days when everyone made fun of my skeleton collarbones. But now that my body is transforming, I'm beautiful, I'm so beautiful. I'm all thick thighs and big pants, the size nines don't do it for me no more. He doesn't know I inherited them from my mother, plus the thick calves and long legs. He doesn't know I inherited them from grandpa. He doesn't know of the teenage girl who puts her clothes on in the bathroom frog before walking out, or the girl who put her pants on first before everything else because mama said so. When he sees me, he likes to imagine a picture perfect me, all warm and fuzzy inside, with my personality in check and my mouth not too ghetto for an African American sister or too proper for a Caucasian girl. He doesn't know of the shaven creams and hot wax. Don't forget the bleaching cream whose only purpose is to corrode my skin. You know, Beyonce says, pretty hurts. You shine on the light of whatever's worst. I'm guessing he wants to shine on this beautiful melanin sister because he finally wants to know what it's like dating a deep melanin sister, especially from the motherland. I listen, but I don't accept his gestures. I'll give you a ride could mean anything to him. It's either he wants to take advantage of me. All right then, can I have your number? Let's be friends. I'll end up giving him a wrong number, but they get, they get bold now to call you and make sure it's the right number. So just block him. Or he just really, really loves my chocolate. <laughs> Period. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I just, yeah, there's so many poems and like so many D different different moments like that but they're all so much the same of like how much they take out of us and like how much we have to engage with them um 
and then and then they become so much a part of of a process or a routine that we do you know the same like oh I'm not interested the same lying the same giving a different name giving a different phone number like it is a it is a process and then it becomes this almost like instinctual thing to do um so just hearing hearing your process and it being so similar to mine even now is like yeah thank you for sharing that thank you thank you so much um, I can share if that's okay great I I'm um, gonna read loudest burial I think this is particularly interesting when I'm talking about slam again so the the poem version that is on like YouTube is very different from the version that I have now because I always edit my poems at least like once a year if if I if I feel like they should be edited so I'm gonna be reading like a very 2020 version which the juxtaposition is always super cool and like always wanting to promote like a growth with yourself and then your work as an extension of yourself. So, yes. Um, okay. In the name of Allah and in the matter of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do we lay this body to rest? A Muslim burial is one of the most important milestones. The hands of your loved ones will watch, wash and watch over your body. Holding back their tears, there is enough water here to cleanse you easy. It is the only kind of water that won't fight you back. Wrap heavy in a thin ivory, the finest silk, white like the kind you've been denied all your life. Now it is here for you. Gone are your earthly possessions. You are back to where you were birthed and your Lord is there, always waiting. But Muslims have been denied their right to burial for years now. Since 2001, we've turned lives to currency, exchanged 3,000 for 2 million, eye for an eye, more like tooth for whole skull, dismembered carcasses and slaughterhouses, creating a trail of blood all over Iran and Syria and into the gallows of Yemen. ISIS, a marching parade through the village, through the alleys, machete in hand and my God's name at the mouth. In the same breath, my mother repeats, subhanAllah, 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 until our mouths are filled with blood too. All our presidents have dipped their hands in blood, yet fist them hidden in pantsuits, even our favorites. Obama has really released more airstrikes than any other, 26,117 of them in counting, created dilapidated buildings, hospitals fell and crumbled in his wake, left are the broken knuckle children collecting in his hands and he's on vacay. Aleppo is on fire, sunken fingers of little children in war, lungs the color of forgotten flesh. I've seen Seen fallen soon to be mothers and dream of birthing all their children. Palestine has been filled with black and brown bodies that have called it home for centuries. Now they name it their empty holy land. Eradicate all the mosques and all the streets with our pious names. My ummah is dying everywhere. By the knife, by water, by fire. It was then Nabra, 17, was murdered in Virginia, swallowed by a water that could have cleansed her beautiful in the holiest month, Ramadan. Zamzam and Marwa cry for her too. It was then they said burn they set fire the burning moss in Bloomington. And I sob as well, a whole river in shame. With all this, Muslims only have overturned grave sites to go to. No place to call home. Trick question. How many times does the Muslim find peace in their life? Twice. Their birth and burial. Everything in between is a constant fight. War zone and small corners, but hell. Worldly matters. Disparity and disorder have been seeping into our afterlives too. Our graves are filled with salted wailing, brimstone violence. Angels don't hang over us. Crows are already ready ready to devour what little life has what life hasn't already taken we become mass graves that look like walking grounds but just because a grave don't hold a tombstone don't mean it isn't a home listen don't you hear that they're asking you to quiet down 
that slow rumble, that swing of broken marrow, all these bones want to do is sleep. All these bodies have no way to get back to their Lord whole. Thank you. That was so beautiful. I love the line where you said, my umma is dying everywhere. And the line where you're talking about, um, there's only two times in Muslim times peace in this world, at their birth and their death. And that is, I can't explain how that makes me feel, but thank you for that. This is amazing. Thank you, Aisha and Khadija. That was yeah, unbelievable. Um, I don't want to forget, Michael, uh, that we have another student we want to introduce to you. Um, Yair, you're still here. Can we see your shining face, Yair? There he is. Um, Hi. I, I am uh, also incredibly privileged to have taught Yair two years in a row as well, first as a junior and then as a senior. He has actually done a, a reading with Father Brown as well. So he's, he's an old pro at this. Um, Yair is a member of the Poetry Club. Um, and Yair was digging on some golden shovels. Um, right on. So Yair, if you wanna, if you wanna introduce yourself and, and talk to Michael. Yeah, okay. Oh, I'm a little nervous. Um, I've just been waiting. <laughs> um, my name is Yair um, and I have been just doing some different poetry for the poetry club. And one day Mr. Zaya said, let's do a golden shovel. And I was like, what is that? Never heard of it, really weird. Um, but he explained and gave us an example. And the example he gave was actually your poem, um, America is Loving Me to Death. And after reading it, I just really loved it. And the format of having that sort of like a message at the end um, of the end of each sentence line and it was just great and I'm really grateful for Mr. Zach because he's always giving us these new prompts and stuff to to do and so yeah I don't know if you wanted to read your poem first and then I could go or whatever whatever you prefer um, okay if you could read your poem first please America is loving me to death. America is loving me to death, loving me to death slowly, and I mainly try not to be disappeared here, <clears throat> knowing she won't pledge even tolerance in return. Dear God, I can't offer allegiance. Right now, 400 years ago, far into the future, it's difficult to ignore or forgive how despised I am and have been in the centuries I've been here. Despised in the design of the flag and in the fealty it demands, lest I be made an example of. In America, there's one winning story, no adaptations. The story imagines a noble grand progress where we're all united, like truths are as self-evident as the declaration states or like they would be, if not for direct detractors like me, the ranks of vagabonds existing to point out what's rotten in America, insisting her gains come at a cost, reminding her who pays and negating wild notions of exceptionalism, adding ugly facts to God's favorite nation mythology. Look, victors get spoils. I know the memories of the vanquished fade away. I hear the enduring Republic erect and proud asking through ravenous teeth, who do you riot for? Tamir, Sandra, Medgar, George, Rihanna, Elijah, Falando, Eric, which one? Like it can't be all of them. Like it can't be the entirety of it. Destroyed brown bodies, dismantled homes. So demolition stands even as my fidelity falls as it must. She erases my reason too, allows one answer to her only loyalty test, yes or no, Michael, do you love this nation? And hates me for saying I can't. 
for not burying myself under her fables where we're one, indivisible, free, just, under God, her God. And I just really loved that. And it was great and amazing. It still is every time I hear it and get the chance to read it. Um, and just before I get into my, just reading my short poem, um, I was just wondering what was your process in writing that poem? Yeah. Um, just having those um, words line up like that. Yeah, I remember it was a Saturday and I woke up and I thought, um, I'm gonna write a, an acrostic golden shovel. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna <clears throat> work off the phrase, America is loving me to death. And I also wanted to incorporate the Pledge of Allegiance and have a conversation about what it means to be expected to love a country that's working towards your destruction. Um, I started that poem uh, not long after Philando Castile was killed, about two miles away from my house. My typical process for writing a poem um, is to, to find an opening, an idea or an image that allows me to begin to write, to write, to rewrite, to kind of tinker around with lines and line breaks and different things like that. And when I get to the point where I feel like I'm doing, where I'm messing it up, I, I set it aside and like to come back to it a couple weeks when I have less of an investment in what I was thinking about that first time through. Uh, this poem took me outside of my typical process. It took me a couple of years and a number of edits before I, I got it to the point where I felt like I was able to work in between those two forms without the form dominating the idea. Um, I wanted to get to the point where most of the people who saw the poem would not see the acrostic or the golden shovel and would respond to it only in that particular way. Um, and, and the process of that, understanding that <laughs> if you change something, it, it can affect the beginning of the line or the end of the line, the, the process of getting it to where I felt pretty good about it. Um, and, you know, when I say a couple of years, I don't mean every day, but um, multiple edits, somewhere around 30, 35 edits, which is also an unusually high number for me before I felt like I had it where I, I wanted it to be. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, okay, you, well, um, I guess I'll read my poem. It's it's a relatively short poem. Um, nothing I too exciting. It. Yeah. Um, um, just a little before I start reading it. Um, so we were just, Mr. Zaya always gives us just a couple minutes to see what we can come up with and to see what, just what flows. And um, I was struggling a little bit trying to find something that I wanted that last part of every line to be. And actually I was just like, I just in the, in the chat, I was like, I just, I need something that calls my name. And actually Khadija, who I think is still on the call, um, was like, why don't you just use that? And so I took the challenge and this is what I came up with. So yeah. Um, walking through my busy street, I make many turns, trying to find what I need. Tranquility, scenery, something to fill the emptiness and loneliness that comes with being away from those who make the late night phone calls when I want to talk, to play, to my friends who call my name. Oh. And so, I love that's, that. That's, that's sort of it. It's just really short. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanna spend more time with that. That elongated line that's so spectacular comes from being away from those who make the late night phone calls. That's such a beautiful way to, to name those people who are important and close and there for you and ex know that you're there for them uh, to express that idea. Um, 
so compactly and so elegantly. I really admire that. Thank you. Oh, thanks mm -hmm. a lot. Um, and yeah, it's, that was sort of what I was trying to get to just um, sort of mentioning those people that I really, I guess, with the pandemic, haven't been able to see, I really mm -hmm. miss and haven't been able to interact with much. So just being on FaceTime with them, being on the phone with them and just um, goofing around on the phone, doing whatever, playing video games, which is something I really love or doing homework together, whatever we can do to spend just a little moment together when we've been apart for so long. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Jacqueline, if I didn't, if I didn't get a chance to say it, thank you to you as well. This has been amazing. Um, and just, I mean, just listening to this, yeah, it's, it's been so moving just hearing the interactions and just kind of the, the things that come, I was saying in an email students, I don't know if I, I share this with you, but one of the things I was really interested in was kind of like the energy that comes in between the poems and not just even though it's a, a Zoom call, like I, I can feel some of that good energy. So thank you for just being present to this. Um, we've got some audience members and you, you've, you've been out there in the audience. I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> I see some great comments in the chat, but um, you know, we've got a little time. I, if you are interested in asking a question, if you, oh yeah, love it. Oh, sorry. I just, um, I don't know if I'm just like spaced out or what, but I think, did we hear Janelle read her poem? J Janelle had shared Stop with me that she, back. she didn't want to read it out loud. Oh, okay. You might have I changed her mind though. <laughs> oh no, I know. I don't want to pressure at all. I just saw it in the document. I was like, no, hey, right, right, right. Yeah. Hold on a second. Okay. Jan Sorry about I, that. No, Thank that's you. no problem. Janelle is amazing. Uh, and yeah, like she, she, she was saying she might want uh, Luffin like some feedback individually, um, but maybe not, not want to read right now in front of everyone. Unless, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. So, if yeah, if folks in the audience, or if poet to poet, right? We've we've got folks who kind of are paired up with each other. But if you want to ask a question to somebody else, um, it could be fun just just to hear what people are thinking, what struck people. If it's a comment, I like to call something a positive blast. If you if something like really moved you you know people talk about putting people on blast but you put someone on positive blast for a line that was just amazing for you or a poem um i just wanted to mention that like this is really fulfilling for me because a lot of the work that i do in madison is doing poetry workshop with folks your age and because of COVID, we haven't been able to do them. So obviously this is not a workshop, but this has just been the same kind of fulfillment that I had. Like, I really miss my students. Um, they're just slightly, just a little younger than y'all. They're like 14, 15. Um, but it, it's like just as heartwarming to just hear like you guys' work and to know that like people are excited about poetry. Like, I remember, I think I just at the time, like I was the only person who was like, doing poetry and like slamming in my year. And I was like, I wish I had a friend and y'all to have like a whole club now. So like, that just makes me feel so happy to like get to hear y'all and be in space with y'all this way. The consistent quality of the poems that you all have shared is extraordinary. I think uh, I think I can safely say I'm the oldest person, maybe combined ages, but I'm the oldest person in the group and I've been reading actively. And what you just got through saying about, gee, I wish there were some others, you know, when you were a certain age. Uh, yeah, I could have used that. I really could have used that because I was the one singled out always. Well, now, Joseph, get up and read something. Oh, you, I, I'm sure you'll be able to do something. Okay. I mean, from the age of five, when, when I was asked that most memorable thing was when my father's mother, the one who'd been married for 63 years, made me get dressed, dressed up for Easter Sunday and get up in church and read a, and recite a poem. 
she regretted it afterwards. <laughs> but that's okay, because she laughed anyhow. But, uh, but being by yourself, and this is what's so absolute, it gives me such joy to have lived long enough to see a group of young people coming down the road singing. That's what I've, that's what I've been feeling tonight. Sitting on a rock, hearing the voices coming around the road. And that's who you all are for me tonight. So thank you very much. I just want to like and subscribe. Uh, just blown away by the poems and the, the thinking behind them. Just the thoughtfulness and intelligence and heart. Um, you guys have something. All of you are well past the work I was making when I was in high school. And I just want to encourage you to stay at it. I'm, I'll be 53 next month. So as you can see, I'm not, I've seen some things is what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, and my first book is coming out a couple months after that. So stay, stay at it. Um, keep writing. Um, I hope that it's a passion that, that you'll stay connected to uh, for a long time. I, I did. I, I started writing in fourth grade and I kept doing it while I was doing other things and, and then eventually figured out uh, I really want to spend more time doing this thing that I love. Um, but I just see so much intelligence and thoughtfulness in the decisions that you guys are making in your poems and how they look uh, in the way that you're reading them. Uh, I, I hope that you'll stay at it and enjoy it. Um, I would like to say it's really interesting seeing how differently everybody writes and um, it was very enjoyable because you can like relate to everybody's poem in a way, but we all write so differently. Okay, I have to head out because I just realized I have a quiz that's due at 10 o'clock, <laughs> but I want to say literally one more thing. Don't, first of all, don't be like me and do your quizzes on time. But um, I just wanted to say, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Zaya. This is so interesting because like I had you as a freshman and I was very thankful for your courses and the book work that you chose. And I was saying this earlier, Mr. Zaya had left for a grip and we were all like, what? But then you came back. And so like, I'm so happy that uh, younger folks at Crystal I also got to have you as um, an English teacher and then also for multiple years too I felt like uh, I learned like a lot in your class and like I hope folks that are taking your class and continue to take your class also learn as much as I did and like get these opportunities that I did too this is very full circle for me I'm probably gonna cry about it after happy tears after I do this quiz I'm gonna be like oh my Thank god you. I'm like old now um okay <laughs> yes but let me go do this quiz um please wish me luck <laughs> bye, bye y'all Aisha I just want to say thank you thank you oh she's gone <laughs> good luck on your quiz <laughs> that is wonderful how about that full circle mm -hmm. <laughs> yes audience members did you want did you want to jump in um questions thoughts Thank you for being here. It, it, it takes attentiveness as, as listeners and readers of poets, and we appreciate you. These comments are wonderful. Seeing your faces is wonderful. I just want to say uh, shout out to Mr. Zaya and all the students and all the poets to watch the, the interaction and the passion and, uh, and the love you are all showing each other. It's just beautiful. So thank you. This has been great. Beautiful. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's really a treat. And, and like I said, even though we're in these weird little boxes on Zoom, like I really, I do feel the, the, the good energy. Um, and I hope someday to meet you all in person uh, and, and thank you, Luffin and Michael. Uh, and Father Brown, I know I will see you in person at some point. 
Um, but it's, yeah, it's really a gift. And you are always welcome, Luffin. You mentioned maybe doing a workshop or something. Oh, that would be so cool. I'll be so happy to do it. We can like maybe do a workshop where they generate work and then like do, um, I find that it's really helpful for students to do like an ask me anything and they can just ask about like industry things. And sometimes, honestly, that could save you like 10 years of time because there's some stuff that I was just trying to figure out in Google and like literally <laughs> someone just answers a few questions it really can be helpful so i'm happy to do that we can set that up that would be amazing yeah. and thank you um all of you is wonderful to listen to your poems the students are so talented so serious um this has been a great night and thank you uh miss trisaya i was just like that. <laughs> you don't have to go <laughs> so disrespectful <laughs> thank you not disrespectful. for organizing this and for giving us the opportunity to to write letters to your students as well that was great too thank you